The Cuyahoga County Health, Human Services, and Aging Committee is now called to order. Uh, Janine, would you please call the roll? Calling the roll, Mr. Jones? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Schron? Mr. Schron is absent at the moment. Mr. Miller? Here. There is a quorum. Also, like the record to reflect that Ms. Simon is in attendance. Excellent. Uh, Janine, has anyone signed in for, for public comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. No one has signed in for public comment related to the agenda. Can we have a motion for the approval of the minutes for the November 16th meeting? I so move. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Our minutes are approved. Well, we have one item on our agenda today. Uh, uh, our typical contract for, for our emergency food purchases. And we also have a presentation from Milestone Parent Coaching. And, uh, but we'll deal with our resolution item first and Janine, if you would read that resolution into the record. Resolution number 2016-0230, authorizing the contract with United Way of Greater Cleveland in the amount not to exceed $1,095,450 for fiscal agent services for emergency food purchases for Cuyahoga County residents for the period 1-1-2017 through 12-31-2017. And gentlemen, if you'd like to speak to this item. Good afternoon, David Merriman, Kaga Job and Family Services, and I'm joined by Bob Math from the Department of Health and Human Services Contracting Office. We are here to present the United Way of Greater Cleveland contract for emergency food services. As uh, the, the chair recognized, this is the county's annual investment in emergency food assistance. I think as you're aware, every year the county provides ex in excess of a million dollars for uh, the food bank and the uh, hunger network to distribute uh, emergency food to residents. Uh, in the past, there's been uh, some different providers that have taken the lead, but over the, over the past five years now, the United Way has been our lead on this project. We've asked them to do so at uh, very, very little administrative cost. I'll let uh, Mr. Math explain that. Uh, but also without much administrative overhead. This is really a successful program because almost all of the money goes to food to help needy people eat. And this is a, really an, ex an excellent program in addressing food insecurity. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Bob to go over how well we're doing and uh, see what questions exist on this program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, United Way Services serves as the fiscal agent and provides administrative responsibility over this grant. Um, the grant is over $1 million. Uh, the administrative cost that, are, that United Way charges is, is a half of 1%. So it's really, it's, it's terribly insignificant, especially given what we asked them to do. Um, just to give you some sense how this, how this million dollars is spent, it, it's, it supports the 33 hunger networks they're part of Hunger Network of Greater Cleveland and eight inner ring suburb uh, expansion grants. Um, they, have, they serve on average about, I suppose it's a, it's a, it's a testament to, unf the unfortunate testament to the food insecurity in our county. Um, they serve about 35,000 households on a quarterly basis, um, about, which represents about 88,000 individuals. You know? um, again, it's, uh, it, it's it's an unfortunate circumstance, but you know the the need is you know it's been it's been somewhat constant you know from quarter to quarter it hasn't varied too much in the past year, um, but it is it is a significant you know indication of the you know poverty levels and the food insecurity in, in our community. Um, during the during, during on an annual basis, they provide you know all the food is purchased at the Cleveland Food Bank, um, and the, the purchase total over six million pounds of food to give you some sense. Um, again, about, about 320,000 people annu annually and about 140,000 households each and every year. Um, and the average cost per pound is about 20 cents per pound, which is uh, based upon a study that was conducted a number of years ago. It stays within the range that uh, we're, you know, that everybody's looking for. And one of the key elements is, you know, is that the food has to be a nutritious value, which is monitored by United Way. So individuals, the hunger centers, when they, when they place their orders, they, they have a, full, a wide range of, uh, of food products to draw from, to order for their, for their customers. You know, one of the other functions that United Way performs for us is they do, uh, they conduct regular evaluations of all the hunger centers, and they do serve, and they survey all the hunger centers that gets just some feedback in terms of satisfaction of the, of the, of the residents that, you know, um, 
that line up to, to receive the food, as well as the delivery methods and, and the quality of the food products. And the satisfaction surveys, for the most part, are always very positive. I think they're, they're pleased with the delivery system that's in place. Um, and, but there, of course, there's just, just challenges with so many people needing assistance with food. So if you're ready for questions. Any questions? If you repeat, repeat, you said 140,000 households are served, and you mentioned 320,000. What was that number again? The 320,000, on, on based on an annual basis, the number of actual individuals that receive food assistance. And the other number, the 140,000 households. Okay. And the 88,000 number, what did that represent? 88,000 represents the number of people, just in the, the, the number of individuals in the third quarter. So it's, it's, you know, it's a couple percent higher than the third quarter last year, but on average it's between 80, you know, 84 and 88,000 you know, um, you know, households uh, each and every, individuals, I'm sorry, each and every quarter. Okay. And Janine, let the record reflect Councilman Jack Schron is in attendance. Are there any questions from the committee? Councilwoman? Uh, through the chair, I just wanted to know what was the, the fee? Are we still in that, uh, the fee that we pay United Way, is it still in roughly in the 18,000? I know it wasn't a increase the last time they did it, but just wonder. You know, through the chair, uh, Councilwoman Conwell, the administrative fee has not changed in, in, the, in the four or five years of managing this contract. It remains at point one half of 1% of the total allocation. So it's about $5,000. Okay. And that hasn't changed at all over the past since we've had this contract. Thank you. Councilman. I'd just like to uh, remind everybody that a week from tomorrow at 3 o'clock, the Cleveland Food Bank is going to give us all an opportunity to help help distribute food to the community for their annual event for for any of us that would like to participate in that. And uh, I just would like to uh, uh, thank you for all the good work you do in helping put this program together and hopefully we can uh, find ways to uh, reduce food insecurity. Uh, it's uh, it, that, uh, that and along with uh, the heroin e epidemic and the infant mortality rate and a few other things indicate how much work we still have to do in spite of the fact that uh, that the economy overall seems to be doing pretty well and and uh, and we've had some phenomenal successes this year but there's still a lot of underlying uh, 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 hurt and poverty and, and, and social problems that we have to deal with. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions from the committee? I have a quick question. I'm not on the committee, but can I ask you a question? Please, go right would ahead. Would some of this food go through United Way to the Euclid Hunger Center? Is that would be a designated place it might go? Uh, you know, Councilman Simon, hunger network, uh, the Euclid Hunger Center is part of that network. Good. Thank you. So they do get an allocation. Great. And I think all of us have either an institution, a, a church, or some facility that that provides, uh, that distributes the food. Um, I know I have uh, quite a few in my own district. And if I go back over the years, uh, when we first took office, we had the Hunger Network, and we had the Cleveland Food Bank working in collaboration, and uh, we brought in this, uh, uh, brought in the United Way. To to um, to help um, with the collaboration and and uh, a more effective distribution of the food, and that uh, you, you mentioned five thousand dollars is the dollar amount, which is a small amount, but the, but they played an important role in that collaboration over the years, and it appears that it's still working to this to this day. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, are there any other questions? It's been a very routine contract. We've seen it every year. And uh, I will make a motion that we uh, approve this contract, recommend it for approval to the full council uh, under second reading suspension. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. All right. At this time, we have a presentation from our the Milestones Parent 
coaching capacity uh, building, and the, the director, I believe, Alana Hoffer Scoff. If you and your team would like to come forward as and present. Yes, thank you so much. <clears throat> Just wanted to thank you so much for this opportunity to come and meet you and to thank you for the support that you've provided to Milestones. Um, I'm here today with Beth Thompson, who is the program director. My name is Ilana hoffer -Skoff. I wanted to first share with you a little history about Milestones and our programs, and uh, then I will turn it over to Beth to share about the Help Desk, which is the program that the Cuyahoga County Council is supporting. And you see our PowerPoint. I'm just going to get comfortable here. Um, I co-founded the organization with Mia buckwell Gellis, and the reason is because of our kids. We have kids who are now young adults but were diagnosed at the age of two, um, and they are part of the statistic of one in 68. Uh, autism is a spectrum. It affects individuals differently, but all of them are impacted in the three areas of behavior, communication, and social interaction. I wanted to show you a visual to share with you um, what you might see with someone with autism. This is my family. We're taking a photo in front of the Cleveland Museum of Art. And you see that my son and my daughter are very close in age. They're about 14 months apart. Uh, so developmentally, they're close. But you see that my son and my husband and I, we know what's going on. We understand that a picture is being taken. And my daughter is looking off. She doesn't understand the social cues. This is just one example I wanted to share of what affects a person with autism. Um, we, as parents, had to do a lot of research to find out what would work for our daughter. And we found that behavioral interventions really made the huge difference. And these are my kids now as adults, that they can have shared attention, that they can have a relationship. But it took a lot of work, and it took a lot of education to get to that point. In our community of Cuyahoga County, 18,500 people are diagnosed with autism. But when we talk about the autism community, we're really not only talking about the individuals diagnosed with autism. We're talking about the family members who are trying to interact. We're talking about the doctors who are trying to support and serve and take care of individuals with autism. We're talking about the teachers. So that number of 18,500 really grows exponentially when you think about the number of people who are part of a team for a person with autism and helping them to really live a fulfilling life. When we started our organization in 2003, uh, there was no clinic school for autism. There was no monarch school for autism. There weren't separate programs really dedicated to autism. And what we found as parents, we were looking for a place that was going to provide education for all those members of that community, for that parent to know what to do, for that teacher who's faced with a classroom of kids who may not have even had one course in autism. So the way we banded together was we created an organization and have a board of directors where one third of the individuals on the board are family members, one third are professionals in the field of autism, and one third are community members who really feel it's important to have this type of a resource. We work with leading partners in the community. You see under government, Cuyahoga County Council is the only government agency that we are working with. And for the first time last this year, 2016, is the first year we ever received funding from a government source. Um, we work with foundations for grants. We have an annual fundraiser. And the agencies and the universities we work with in terms of their expertise, we share our training with them. We invite them to our annual conference. Um, so we're really working with those who are experts in the field of autism. We have a full-time staff of 10, plus some interns. We have um, interns with autism who work with us as well. And we include the voice of individuals with autism on our board and through our committee work as well, and as speakers at our conference. I want to share with you before Beth talks about the individual program that the council is supporting so you understand the overview of our services. Um, we have an online resource, which is everything about autism, really Northeast Ohio, which means Cuyahoga and the seven, the seven county area for us. 
Um, in one place, you can find a community calendar. You can find frequently asked questions and toolkits. We also offer our free help desk. About 500 families are served through this, and Beth will talk a little bit more about those services. We have an annual conference. It's held at the IX Center. About 1,000 people attend. Basically, most are from Cuyahoga County, but also throughout the state. They come in neighboring states. This year, Temple Grandin, who's a leading expert on autism and uh, arguably the most famous person with autism, is coming to Cleveland and will be speaking at Playhouse Square as part of our conference. We also offer individualized consultation and trainings for agencies as well as for individuals and their families. What's unique about Milestones is that we are an independent organization serving and investing in our local community. This will be a question that you may have or a question that others in the community will say, well, why do you have a Milestones if you have other autism groups? The way we are different is we have a professional staff that's answering people's calls. We have a, a coaching staff, again, you're gonna hear a little bit more, but has a multidisciplinary approach. We're committed to really learning about the local resources so that when someone calls us, we can tell them who is the contact person at that agency. We can tell them are they taking insurance or not. We can tell them whether they're serving clients with autism. It's not just a phone book that you're reaching out to. We really have vetted those resources. And we're committed to evidence-based approaches. You know, when a parent is hit with a diagnosis of autism or something else, they're reading up online, they're trying to find things out, but that information may really not be secure, may not be vetted, may not be uh, supporting research that's been proven to be effective to be used with, with their child. That's very important to us. We want to be mindful of information that we are sharing. We want to know that there's evidence to support it. The other thing about Milestones is that we're committed to the whole family and we're committed to the professionals who are serving that individual with autism. And we're a neutral agency, so if you're calling us about information, we're sharing the information that we think is best for you and your family, given the particulars in that situation. If you're calling another agency, they may have a program to promote, or a school, or a therapy, and it's their right to do so, but I think what's important is that you have a source of neutral information to share and to guide a family. Today we have our help desk team with us. Um, Beth Thompson, who is our program director, has a wealth of knowledge, particularly in the area of teens and transition. Uh, she came to us from LEAP as a youth transition specialist linking employment abilities and potential. She's a field advisor for Case Graduate School for Social Work, and she's going to introduce the rest of her staff. Thank you so much for having us. Please pardon my voice as I get over a cold. <clears throat> as Alana mentioned, we are one of the only agencies where a family or professional can call and actually speak with professionals that have specializations in multiple disciplines. Um, I serve as program director and oversee three staff. Um, our first staff, Haley Dunn, comes from a background in um, a degree in counseling and mental health, and she saw, oversaw a program in Southern Ohio called Bridges, which is on the forefront of successful transition to employment programs for individuals with developmental disabilities, and she is serving as our new teen and adult coordinator. Our coaching and referral specialist, Monica Kachaney, has an extensive background in special education and came to us from the Council of Economic Opportunity in Greater Cleveland as a Disability and Mental Health Coordinator. And lastly, our um, most seasoned staff, Helena Farkas, joined us after 35 years working at Metro Health in their comprehensive care department. She has a specialization in children who are medically fragile in low-income populations. When families call, they're routed to one of our staff based on their age and need and type of disability. Um, I want to reference both the PowerPoint slide and in your handout, we have a statistics summary. On the statistics summary, you'll see that from January to November 2016, <laughs> that's very kind of you. Cleveland weather got the best of me. 
very bad. <laughs> well, Milestones does believe it takes a team approach, so I appreciate that. <laughs> We typically serve around 500 individuals through our free help desk every year. And you can see on the statistics summary that the average age is 17. And one of the reasons that we do have um, a teen adult services specialist, because this transition time for our individuals leaving high school and entering the adult field of employment and housing um, is a critical point for all of our individuals that we serve, as well as the families and professionals that wrap around them. You can also see... Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, did you say the average age was 17? The average age is 17 years old. On the statistics summary um, in your packet, in the orange packet. Mm -hmm. This page? Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, we, we serve from um, birth, and our oldest client in the past year was 69 years old. So it is a really large um, age span. And you can see the top um, five topics that parents typically call about, as well as individuals themselves and professionals. And then there is a breakdown um, beneath who is calling us and from what region. You can see that 65% of our callers are from Cuyahoga. Um, <clears throat> uh, an important part about Milestones is that we really do connect with the leading partners in the area and help our families and other professionals to connect with them. And I think this is reflected in how many organizations do refer their families to us. Um, we have a very strong connection with the leading medical facilities in the area. And I'm going to give an example of uh, one of our partners um, in that. Um, from the PowerPoint slide, you can see um, we have a varied amount of uh, agencies and points of contact that refer to milestones. We are a respected agency in the community and people feel comfortable and secure recommending that they contact us in our free help desk because of the service that we provide um, is, is really not available anywhere else in the community. Uh, this is one of our, our partners. Uh, this is Beth Mishkin. She serves as the autism navigator at UH Rainbow Babies. Uh, UH recognized um, a few years ago that there was a, such a prevalence in the increase of individuals um, being diagnosed with autism that they actually embedded a full-time position of autism navigator. Um, even though Beth specializes in autism, she often refers families to milestones because we can provide unique support, as Alana said, and a neutral voice for them. Um, Beth wanted to be here today, but she's actually with her kiddos at the clinic. Um, but she wanted to share that for her patients, the help desk is an excellent resource and source of support. As a professional, it's extremely helpful to have a resource to call when I need to. So not only does Beth call our help desk um, on behalf of her clients, she has her families give us a call at points of transition or critical time periods where they need assistance. Um, we unfortunately um, could not have Tana Turner, one of our clients, join us today because she had to attend a funeral. Um, but she did um, want the, the council to know that she really thought that this was her opportunity to give back to Milestones in the same way that we've given to her. And she wanted us to share her story on her behalf. Um, this is just one of our clients. Uh, Tana originally came to us a little less than a year ago. She has a four-year-old son named Jonathan who was diagnosed with ASD. She is a single mom who lives in Parma. When she originally contacted us, she um, had had to quit her job to deal with the behaviors that her child was exhibiting. They were so significant, she couldn't find the support she needed in order to maintain her job. She had lost her job, was in an um, unhealthy and unsafe environment um, in an apartment where she and her son lived, and had had to voluntarily relinquish her car in order to qualify for benefits that she knew she needed to support herself and her child. She called us with a sense of hopelessness, and since the first contact to our help desk, she now feels that she has a better sense of the services that she and her son can take advantage of and the effective route to gain those supports. Um, Tana had never been connected to the County Board of Developmental Disabilities, even though she had had a diagnosis from a pediatrician. She had never been connected to her school district or told her rights 
as a mother of a child with special needs. She had never even been connected to the Department of Health in regarding the concerns that her living, her living situation was facing with her. Milestones connected her to the County Board of DD, connected her to her school district, and provided her with an opportunity to really form a team around her and her child that would provide lifelong supports and resources to her. Not only were we able to connect her with financial resources to support her and her son, we were able to give her access to all of the resources that could really help her son reach his full potential. Milestones has served as a lifeline to Tana. She has consistently called us every month as she moves forward in progress and getting her son connected to appropriate therapies and educational programs. If she hadn't reached out to Milestones, Tana believes that she would have risked becoming homeless, possibly risked losing custody of her son, and would not have been able to get the proper education and therapy for her, for her son, Jonathan. Since she has contacted Milestones, she has a support administrator through the County Board of Developmental Disabilities. She has access to financial resources, and she now has an IEP for her son going into school. Milestones, as an independent source, could connect her to the appropriate resources and that were right for her and her son, Jonathan. Her next goal is that as Jonathan enters full-time school, that she can re-enter the workforce to support herself and her son. Um, Tana faced and still faces what many parents who have children on the spectrum face, tremendous financial strain in trying to meet the needs of their child. We were able to connect her to the appropriate partners and put her and her son on a path towards success. If, if Milestones is able to maintain the funding that the, the county has supported, we would like to be able to dedicate our staff to over these over 500 calls we get. Our staff are dedicated across all of those four core programs, so our families typically have to wait five days for a staff to be assigned their case and get back to them. If we were able to have our professional staff contact these families immediately and start working with them, we believe that they could access resources and start to achieve their goals much sooner and start to put into place that team that's going to support them and their child for their lifetime. If we, um, if we aren't able to continue or expand that funding, we are unsure if we can maintain the help desk as a, as a free resource. Um, which Tana and many other parents couldn't have afforded to pay another agency for, for, for help and, and finding resources. Um, so this is one of our most critical programs and is completely unique, uh, not only to this county, but to the state, and offering evidence-based research and resources when families and professionals call, as opposed to a 211, we actually help them navigate we actually connect them to the right person and get them the resources in, in a timely fashion so that they can meet the needs of their child. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and to share even a few stories. Uh, the reason why we are in existence is that we're here to improve the lives of individuals affected by autism. These are just some of our clients. Um, we are very strategic and planful in how we operate the organization, and we want to make sure that we're sustaining and supporting ourselves in a way that to be there for the community. And the other very important part of our mission is that we want the community to recognize the important impact and contribution that individuals with autism can make to the community so that they're not only on the end of receiving support, but they're also contributing members of society. Working with individuals with autism and their families families so that they can get the appropriate education, so that they can graduate and hold down a job with appropriate supports is going to be better for our community, for our companies, and, and for, every, for the individuals themselves. So we wanted to open up if there were any questions, and we thank you so much. Again, thank you. Uh, committee, any questions? Councilwoman Tomko? 
to the chair, just wondering what is your um, connection with uh, the achievement centers? Do you work in relation with the achievement, achievement centers? Yes, the Achievement Centers uh, has been very supportive and worked with us in a collaborative fashion. I mentioned we have our annual conference. Members of the Achievement Center staff sit on our uh, conference steering committee and planning committee. Uh, they attend the conference, they present, they're exhibitors at the conference. We've had a close relationship with them in terms of referrals back and forth. So we definitely do work with them. Thank you for asking. And that's true of Monarch and the clinic and the Achievement Center and PEP and the different school districts. Um, we've worked with uh, over 275 different agencies attending the conference um, and as referrals. We mentioned we have over 1,000 resources online. That includes, I don't know if we have Wi-Fi, but I can show you online our resource center by um, age so and also by topic. If you were looking for particular schools, you would click on there and then you'd be able to find the schools that have specific programs for autism students and achievement centers is one of them. Councilwoman Ms. Simon. Oh, I thought you had a question. Uh, you, you touched 18, you, you said there are 18,500 diagnosed, diagnosed. Uh, With autism. How many of those do you actually touch? So we touch people in different ways. Um, in terms of our resources online, uh, the current numbers are 69,000 unique visitors come to our website. The conference each year, we have about 1,000 people come. Our database has about 11,000 emails, and those are people who have attended programs over the years that we continue to talk to. The people actually calling our help desk, only about 500. One of the things that's concerning to us is when you look at the, the graph of how people hear about us, I mean, you see areas that we need to work on. 14% are coming from the hospitals, only about 2 or 3% are coming from the schools. And yet, the school population attending the conference, that's about 75% of our attendees are school personnel. So there's a disconnect there in terms of them guiding their families to us as a resource. So there's definitely work on our end in terms of getting the word out more, which requires support and ways to market with the community. Yeah. Any further questions? Councilman Miller. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. and. Uh, and I'm wondering about Asperger's syndrome. I, I'm, I've heard various things from it's a mild form of, of autism to it's a separate illness to it doesn't really exist. And, and, and I'm just wondering what the latest professional thinking is on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do have Wi-Fi if you wanted me to show that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the question about uh, Asperger's, so autism is a spectrum and technically called autism spectrum disorder. And so within that umbrella, Asperger's is included. The new diagnosis criteria has now said that instead of giving the diagnosis of Asperger's, doctors are now giving autism as the diagnosis, autism spectrum disorder, and Asperger's is included within that. Did you want to add something? Go ahead. Um, the, the new DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for how um, individuals are diagnosed with autism, um, no longer recognizes a variation in the disorder. Um, before, we used to say like high and low functioning and would deem somebody with Asperger's high functioning. And what we know as a community, and I have to give um, a lot of credit to Cleveland because one of the three individuals that changed that DSM is, is here in Cleveland, Dr. Tom Frazier. Um, of the Cleveland Clinic, but they they have said it's a spectrum. Somebody can be highly verbal and not highly adaptable. Um, you can be what's perceived as very intelligent or what we could have called Asperger's and not able to hold on a job, but you can be nonverbal and be highly adaptable and be able to, to work competitively in the field. So they really um, have done away with any other. There used to be about five different diagnoses of autism, and now it's just a, a spectrum. Would you like to see, how would I do that? Uh, I'm just going to show you our website. Uh, this is the Milestones website. And under online resources, we have, this is an amazing feature, the community calendar. So. If you're looking for anything about my autism, 
and you come to the site, you can find out what's going on, uh, social rec opportunities, benefits, support groups, uh, within particular communities, Akron, Alliance, Ashtabula, Bay Village, Beechwood, um, and find out about everything in one place about autism. There, the common complaint about uh, for teens and adults is there's nothing going on socially. Every month we share a newsletter listing 60 different social rec opportunities. So we have it all in one place for people. The resource center here is what I described and People can look up by different categories and by age. So we had talked about schools and the Achievement Centers for Children is number one there. So this is a great resource for people. And what's helpful for Milestones is we're trying to touch people where it's helpful. If you have a child with autism, it's very hard. You're managing a lot of different things. So be able to go to one place 24-7 is a great thing. To be able to know that you can pick up the phone and say, you know, I'm going into IEP, I'm not sure what to do, there's someone who can answer your call. Uh, I'm not sure about this new challenging behavior, what do I do? Do you have a recommendation for a psychologist, psychiatrist, or behavior therapist? You have a whole long list, I'm not sure, can you give me guidance? And we're there to answer those calls for people. Uh, Councilwoman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess the question that I have, I don't, um, you hear it a lot, but I really don't have a full understanding. So is it behavioral and um, the ability to learn, or is it something that can be treated with medicine, or is it more of a behavioral uh, diagnosis? It's a combination, if you don't mind, if you want to expand a little bit. Autism is a developmental disability, which essentially means something occurred before the age of three that's going to have a lifelong impact. Autism affects behavior, communication, um, sensory processing, um, and socialization. Pardon me. Um, just like we said, there is a spectrum. It can impact people uh, in different ways. So about 50% of individuals with autism have an average or above IQ. Um, and about 50% have some kind of intellectual disability. So it can impact their academic learning, and in some cases, that's not the challenge that our, our children face. They may fly through their academics, but be really challenged with maybe repetitive or restricted behaviors, um, or issues with socialization, which make the majority of their life very difficult to maintain. Even with close familiar relationships, they might have difficulty navigating those, those social rules. So it's a, a neurological um, disability um, that's actually being studied quite heavily uh, here in case. Um, is that helpful? Yeah, that also about the For the medi medicine? Oh, oh thank you. Um, what we know from autism is that the most effective intervention is applied behavioral analysis, which is a type of behavioral therapy. There's no specific medicine to treat autism. There are medicines to address um, typical comorbid disorders. About 25% of individuals on the autism spectrum also have um, comorbid mental health issues, such as anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. There are medications to treat more of those things, but there's no medication to specifically treat autism. And the other question um, that I, I had with regards to the age um, and the average age being 17 years old, um, do, you, do you have a um, reason as to why it's 17? Is it because people are transitioning into adulthood and they need to learn how to function more on their own? Or what's the... Legally, children are, are um, permitted to stay into school with a disability until the age of 22 but that has to be deemed appropriate by the school. Um, but on average, um, individuals will graduate out of school services at the age of 18. While they're in school, they're covered under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which federally mandates that they should receive the services that are most appropriate to achieve their educational and, and you know, comprehensive life goals. So they get therapy in school, they get socialization classes, they get accommodations given to them. As soon as they graduate from school, our community often calls it falling off the cliff, they lose access to all of those therapies, perhaps the transportation that took them to where they spent the day, and they're thrown into the adult world, which is um, quite underfunded um, and often leaves them without a day program or without access to the therapies that they need, such as speech or behavioral therapy. Um, so 
they can have a, an amazing educational experience or a great team as a child in school, and the minute that they exit, they are without any supports. I just wanted to add in terms of the therapies um, that we have a list and you have all kinds of interventions and you'll see under therapy, ABA consultants, uh, art therapy, music therapy, occupational, physical therapists, um, speech language, pathology, therapeutic writing. There are a lot of, there are a number of different interventions and it is part of what we do working with families on what would be most appropriate for your child what would be most beneficial. You have limited time, you have limited resources, you have limited attention from that child. You know, so some people are trying to throw a lot of different things, diets, and you know, those kinds of things. So it is, it gets more and more complicated. And one of the things that's really important to us is to see the family where they're at. Um, the, the example from today is a, a, a client who has multiple barriers and difficulties and the autism is only compounding that. But we can tell you about families and other situations where it's, funding is going to be an issue wherever you live, and your advocacy level is going to be an issue wherever you live. You can be in the best school district, but if you as a parent don't know to ask for certain services, you don't get them. They're not just offered to you. Similarly with the county board or other agencies, the parent needs to know what to ask for, and that's where the education comes from. And that's, that's unfortunate because in the same school district, you have somebody with an aid, somebody without Somebody gets extended school year, somebody who doesn't, somebody who's having support from an adult agency and it's appropriate match for employment, and somebody who doesn't. And the thing that's different about that is the educational level in terms of awareness of rights and what's, a, what's right for your family and what's available. It's very sad, but that's, that's why we started Milestones. We saw the difference. For people to reach their potential, it was education. If the teachers didn't know the strategies, how could they share them with their student? If the parent didn't know to ask, how would they be able to help their child? You know, that, that's amazing to me, but that's really across the board. If people aren't educated, don't have that opportunity for that education. So as an organization, we talked about what's unique about Milestones. That's the thing. Our emphasis on education for all members of that community who's a, 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 um, impacted by autism, there's no one like us. If you look across the country, our only model is Autism New Jersey in terms of an organization that was started by parents focused on education with a conference with the opportunity for a free help desk. There isn't anything else like it, so Cuyahoga is very lucky and we're very grateful for the support you've given us to expand this program. Mm -hmm. Councilman Schron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, not trying to get judgmental, but there's you know, conversations going on in regards to uh, autism as to whether it's genetic or whether it's caused by chemical or caused by vaccines and all that. Do you do you entertain that full conversation? And I'm not trying to say one. Where is the where is there a correct answer in regards to that? But do you entertain the the entire conversation on that? I, I'm going to turn over to Beth to talk about this. This is a matter of research, and Case Western is one of the places where some research is going on. But I, in terms of expanding conversation. Um, we do provide a lot of trainings in the community. I like to say before somebody comes into contact with one of my kids, I want to come into contact with them first so that they get those evidence-based strategies to work appropriately with them. So I do address this all the time. What we do know, um, and it's not controversial, it's just fact, what we do know is that there is a genetic link. And that genetic link was actually first identified at Case Western Reserve. Um, so we know that if um, a family has one child on the spectrum, they're 2 to 8% more likely to have another child on the spectrum. And we know that if there's a parent on the spectrum, they're more likely to have a child on the spectrum. Um, we don't know as a community, you know, nationally at large, what is kicking that genetic link off. Um, what we do know is um, vaccines are not, and I think that's a controversial issue in the community as to, to what... Uh, might be causing autism, but there's been a significant amount of research to prove that it's not vaccines, and there is still um, a lot of ongoing research. Um, throughout the nation, we have Centers for Excellence in Autism Research. Case has one of them, the Eye Care Program, and they are diligently um, researching what is kicking that genetic link off. Um, but the, the increase, um, five years ago when I came to Milestones, it was 1 in 150 children had autism. Now it's 1 in 168. 
Um, what we can say about that increase is about half are new cases, they weren't here before, and about half are essentially relabeled. We would have referred to those individuals as mentally retarded, MR, um, and now they are being um, diagnosed with autism spectrum, which is a much more specific diagnosis as opposed to this general MR label. Is that helpful? Uh, it's helpful that you gave me your opinion, but it's not helpful that you that you entertain uh, if whether or not, and I don't know whether there is a, because I have uh, a nephew that's that uh, has been diagnosed with autism, and and we have um, a number of of students that come down from CVEC uh, into mm -hmm. my my office every day. We have six students last year and nine students this year that are part of my uh, part of our team. And so uh, I can tell you that at least whether they're correct or not, there's, an, uh, there's a perception that there are other potential intervening facts that quote the research. Um, you know, we have research about all kinds of things uh, uh, for, for generations and multiple things, and sometimes it found out that their the worth really wasn't flat. Um, and I'm not trying to suggest that they're right or wrong, but I can tell you that some of the parents don't have a complete, they're not accepting uh, all of that quote research at this point in time. So I just more curious as to whether you actually entertain the discussion, whether the discussion is correct or not, uh, is more I think more relevant that you have the whole spectrum of discussion as opposed to uh, saying that uh, the research produces this or that uh, out there. I'll tell you our focus, education and. Because our focus is on education, we're a very practical organization. We're pragmatic. I don't, it, in some sense, it doesn't matter to me how you got it. What's more important to me is you have it. It's going to be a lifelong challenge. And how can I help you and your family reach the potential that will be best for you guys? As a, you know what I'm saying? There are other organizations that may be focused on the research side of why and um, what to do in utero and what to do, do you know what I'm saying? What's, what's very important to us as an organization is that it's a disability here now. I, there is no cure on the horizon, so how can I help provide a more effective uh, outcome? Yeah, I, do you know I, what I'm saying? No, I understand And, that. and the yeah. other thing in terms of do we allow the range of conversation, you know, again, because people have limited time and resources, I do want to connect people with approaches that have evidence to support them. If they as a family are very interested in exploring the diets, we'll connect them to resources that are available. We'll let them know that research supports these other things, but if that's where you want to go, uh, there are social recreation opportunities that they may not have evidence to support them learning that skill, but maybe there's some other thing that, for example, you're teaching them a hobby and they're enjoying it, and that's great for quality of life. So. We're going to connect people to the resources that they want and they're looking for and give them the guiding questions that will help them make the choices. And we have a different emphasis than, I think, your question. Does my, that make my, sense? My question is that if, and I perceive you're, you're a strong uh, resource for knowledge, and so therefore it's very likely that not only would the person or the parent um, come to you after the diagnosis, but it's also likely they're going to be seeking you out in uh, during the maternity uh, pregnancy side and say what do I do and do I need to be prepared and how is there anything I'm doing physically that could be contributing so that the, the pregnant we, mother we might actually, be worried about you know it's an interesting question we actually don't get that call really okay. I would think that they would call their pediatrician and discuss that because those are medical questions and they don't seek us out I mean okay because if I got a family member I, I'm thinking that I, I, to I, prevent I, yeah I then, think I think we haven't. The only person who might call is, I already have a child with autism. I'm yes, afraid exactly. for the future. And then I think we would connect them to physicians for that support. But we really don't get that call. I think that's very interesting. Okay, we my don't niece, get my that nephew, call. My, uh, my uncle had it. So, right. so I would have thought it would have been a lot, fairly logical component that would have been yeah. on, your, on, on your chart saying... Uh, what ifs uh, out mm -hmm. there? And, uh, mm -hmm. it, it was more curiosity from my standpoint out there. And then, are the, then are the service providers all part of uh, part of of your website and interconnection? Uh, yes. So that uh, yes. I saw a list under but here. Yeah. Could could I find somebody Diagnosis that's a service provider that's, that's not part of your your? Sitting, what did there, you say? Is there a service provider someplace within the community that's not part of of trying of, of your organization or or, or stream? 
we can we have a, a process in terms of how we vet and research and select um, places that we would list, um, which I can turn over to Beth to talk a little bit about. Um, but um, one of the things that is I think helpful here is these guiding questions, so that if you are trying to decide who to choose, if you're trying to choose a doctor, let's say, having an understanding of what are what's important for you to ask them. Do they have experience working with individuals with autism? Do they have some training working with autism? One of the things that really is important to us is families should be able to make their own decision. We just want you to be informed sure. and make That's your great. decision based on information. And this, this understanding that it's a lifelong challenge, and rather than every time it's a crisis, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to build a team around me. Milestones is a member of that team. But there will be other people. Let me, let me train that babysitter and educate them on how to work with my child. Let me train grandma and grandpa so that they can really help. And not the grandparents feel very overwhelmed with this. They want to help the children. They feel like the parents should be doing more and more and more maybe. Or they think that parents are, are being too strict. Grandparents are an important component here in terms of that family support um, because they want to help too and they're not sure how to do it. Uh, so all of those different people. So this is an example, I think, I just want to show you one of these guiding questions because we want parents to be able to make their own choices, and if they are interested in some things that we don't necessarily have, they should just be informed on how to find the information. Well, let me turn it over to you about how we vet our resources. Um, very similar to the guiding questions that Alana brought up, we're asking the providers very typical questions. Do they have experience working with individuals with autism? What's their experience? Um, we want to make sure that they're not, um, the providers aren't using fly-by-the-night therapies, um, that they aren't telling um, families to do harmful um, interventions. There are, are people in places that say really harmful and non-medically um, based things. Um, so we're not going to recommend um, somebody that it could be using interventions that could be harmful to, to that child or that adult on the spectrum. Um, and we have our, our full-time staff is actually going out and making these relationships with all of the providers that we do have listing. So when we connect somebody like Tana Turner to the county board, we're not just connecting her to the county board, we're connecting them with the exact right person that that family needs to get assistance. Um, so we develop relationships with all the places that we refer to so that we can make sure that our families have an easier time connecting with them and navigating those services. Um, and I, and I would agree with you com completely that uh, the, these uh, students that we have from, from CVIC, um, when they hit 22, they hit a wall. And there are, and sometimes it's even before that, depending on what the school system decides as to when they, when they cut off funding. It, it's not automatically at 22. It's whenever, right. it's whenever the school system makes that determination. And uh, all the parents that come uh, that are part of our, part of our family now, um, they recognize that. And so they... They really are worried about what happens when they hit that that, that spot because they're they're no longer part of the accepted school system and they're on their own right. at that point in time. Thank you. Right, thank you. If I understood correctly, you uh, heard you correctly. You mentioned that sometimes the causes were from three and under, ages three and under. The diagnosis. The, the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, a component of having a developmental disability is that it has to occur occur before the age of three, occur before. and that it's lifelong. So if, if the behaviors or symptoms weren't occurring before the age of three, then that's not a developmental disability. When you said that, it made me think of Help Me Grow. Uh, do you have any connection or referral to them? How does, what type of relationship have you had with them? Um, yeah, um, we're very blessed to have such an experienced staff. We have a staff that actually worked um, with that program, and we refer to Help Me Grow uh, quite often. Tana Turner, the example that we shared today, was not connected um, for you know, for whatever reason, by her pediatrician or any other support that she had um, to get that support in home, um, so that is a very common uh, referral that we give to our parents. Okay. And I think our our records are that Tana connected through the internet. Yes. So she had a pediatrician, but they didn't, weren't telling. So the, one of the things we put in your packet is our service cards. And our free help desk, which is supported by the Cuyahoga County Council, this is the kind of thing we would like to make sure it gets into the hands of all the pediatricians. It's an easy thing that they can hand out and lets people know what they can find on the website, but also what they can call us about. So that's a program we would like to institute. Um, 
so that people can hear about it and get the resources they need as soon as possible. Okay. So again, you are a staff of four? Did I hear For that correctly? The, co the help desk is a yes. staff of four, yes. Four. One person's not here. Okay, and, yeah. and your budget from the county is $300,000? The budget from the county, we wish, is oh, $50,000 for 2016 and $50,000 for 2017. And with the funding this year, we were able to expand to add another person so that we have this multidisciplinary approach. We were looking ahead. We know the rates for comorbidity. We got, had been getting a lot of uh, calls about mental health concerns for individuals with autism, so we were so lucky to add Haley to that. Um, this was part of an expansion. We did go to a number of foundations to add Monica so that we could have someone who's really working on the school age, and then we were able to add Haley for the teens and adults and the mental health concerns. So right now, our staff of, of four their hand is in a number of things. We showed you the website, the conference. They aren't as dedicated to help desk as we would like. We would love to see additional funding so that we could really be dedicating them to these services and expand this opportunity for families. So right now it is $100,000. Over two years. Over two years. Right. Okay. So That's we came to in the middle, right? So we're coming at the end of 2016. Those health and human service dollars. Yes. Which department are you? Is it a Department of Developmental who do you receive the funding from? What department? Maybe Sunny can. Just as a refresher, of uh, course, from our original budget hearing on the um, last year, we council, county council, put in this, approved this additional funding for Milestone, and it comes out of health and human service dollars. So it comes directly from us as county council. That's why we're recognized as a source of funding. We added that to the executive's budget as part of the process. And, and I think. Uh, it, I think it's so important to understand, I've learned so much from, from Milestones myself, is how each case is unique, each child is unique, each case deserves and, and receives individual care. And, and what it does, obviously you know this approach, I mean, if we can take care of these individuals, it, it really reduces the problems everywhere else in terms of homelessness, just the ripple effect of having a child on the spectrum can create so many other problems that our dollars go toward rectifying. So it's really, really getting to the heart of this and it's not getting smaller, the population. I understand, I just heard today, it's, it seems to be increasing, correct? You know, it's the numbers are increasing, plus it's the things we've just been talking about because as the individuals are getting older, they are descending onto the community without a safety net, without plans in place. Ohio is an employment first state, which means that upon graduation, you should be working competitively in the community. Well, anyone who's graduating today or last year or next year has not been prepared for that. And the agencies haven't been prepared and the employers haven't been prepared. So that we have a lot of work to do in that area. Um, one of the things, um, Beth mentioned how we would like to expand which, with just with dedicated staff. The other area is in workforce development. In, uh, in Michigan, um, there's a news story now going out that the Ford is working with their local autism alliance on that issue, helping prepare young people, making that connection with the company, providing that support and training. This has a ripple effect into other areas, and so as they are graduating, we need to figure out as a community how we're going to support them and the employment so that they can be um, not on, on government assistance their entire lives or not on the level of government assistance that it is currently. So thank you. Yeah, this was a council initiative, and, and you know, I hope we can – thanks for reporting back just thank so you. council knows what, we're, what success we're seeing from this small amount relatively. Excellent. Any further questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. And, and we thank you as well. We appreciate you coming in and, and giving us an update and keeping this before us. I, I, what I learned today was that uh, individuals, you would think that people would automatically get help, but without that knowledge, uh, they need to be equipped just to get the help that's available. Yeah. So again, we, we thank you for presenting to us. Thank you so much. Right. Would you like to acknowledge those that you, you brought with you? Oh, thank you so much. Um, Monica Chicaney from our help desk. Haley Dunn and Laura Montag. They are just a few of our staff that um, have come to represent our uh, association and, and specifically the help desk. So yes. thank you for having us here. Okay, again, thank you. All right.
Thank you. Return my tissues. <laughs> okay. That's, is there any miscellaneous business? If there's nothing from council or my colleagues. Uh, Janine, has anyone signed in for pu public uh, comment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Lou. Ms. Lou. In. Yes, Ms. Lou, please come forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry that I missed l uh, the last meeting, so I didn't get a chance to learn all the wisdoms you could offer live. Uh, I have to review from the either video or from Mr. Tarter's blog to learn. Um, I'm here today uh, to let you know that, yes, there will be a bid for both men's and women's shelter, I mean, very soon. But um, unfortunately, that PRF really has some flaws we cannot really comprehend. So I did go to the county controlling board meeting to make the prediction because it seems like the PRF at first only gave all service providers very short time to prepare the, the big documents. And I say, that's not really good because all the holiday, this and that, and you have to check out all your resources, check out everything. That's not very promising. And so they did extend the time, the deadline, so the people will have a little bit more time if they really want to contribute more, you know, more of their resources to this uh, particular service, which is a good thing. And I have also heard there will be competitors rather than just frontline service. When I went to that meeting the Monday, I did actually uh, say the frontline service should be disqualified because in the uh, PRF, say the requirements, they, you have to have an experience running shelter for 150 or even more beds per day as a clean, safe place. I myself, I can tell you right away, I became domestic violence victims after I came to the shelter. The shelter is completely not safe. So based on lots of uh, facts I named it there, I say frontline service itself should be disqualified. Let other service provider offer their service to fulfill county's good intention and to deliver a better quality service. And also the ripple effect. Uh, today our presentation, just like last time, the Board of uh, Developmental Disabilities, unfortunately, currently at the shelters, we do have people already have autism spectrum as an adult. There are lots of things they cannot comprehend and staff, some of them just don't have the heart to understand or to help them in the way, you know, they can comprehend you. And so I think this is not a very good uh, situation, but yes, our ESG dollars are still limited to hire uh, people on a professional level to take care of all these different needs probably is not very easy at all. However, I don't know why these services cannot be extended into shelter. Thank you. Thank you. Janine, has anyone else signed in for public comment? No, Mr. Chair. No. All right. Well, if nothing else holds our attention, our meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>